Thank you so much. And thank you to Nikolai for the invitation. I think it's been great two days. So I come from Novo Nordisk, the company, and we actually live of selling drugs to humans, right? So it's very important for me to understand if things work in humans. But of course, coming from the early research, I also do a lot of studies in rodents. So the translational, I'm going to talk about that today on 21. The other thing coming out of these two days is actually some of the wondering, you know, why would glucagon being involved in fasting actually increase energy expenditure? Some, some of these very basic questions I, I, I've also tried to address, uh, daring to go into the physiology even when Jens is being present here. So, so that's the plan. Um, and, and so thank you for inviting FTL21 as a special guest for the Glucagon 100 year celebration. I thought that was great. But we also already had the introduction by Tino about FTL21. But of course, there are two things that actually kind of put FTL21 in relation to, to uh, FTF21, and one of them is actually that early data showed that FTF21 was involved in fasting. In this early study from 2007, uh, FTF21 was increased in mouse uh, liver in response to a 24 hours fast, and there was also increase in plasma. And then you can think, okay, glucagon is also in involved in fasting, so maybe this are somehow connected. So there was actually a review written about that. So that was the first kind of thing. The second thing is the studies from Matthias Chub groups with uh, Kirk Harberger on here showing FTF21 is, depend, uh, is necessary for glucagon lowering effect that Tino nicely worked through. And then um, I together with Boerain published a paper in 2014 also showing very, very high level of plasma FTF21 in the glucagon receptor knockout mice. And I remember at the uh, ADA, I think in 2014, I had the poster next to Kirk and we were like, okay, <laughs> two different worlds here. Um, so anyway, this is the agenda. I'll talk about the pharmacology, uh, something about glucagon, and of course it will be mainly FTF21, because that's kind of what I work on, because I actually come from uh, the liver dis disease research department at Novo Nordisk. Um, and then I'll show a few slides on the glucagon receptor knockout mice and the effect on FTF21 there. And then I dare to go into this uh, physiology discussion about the role of both glucagon and FTF21 in fasting and feeding. Uh, so what is FTF21? And now we are celebrating 100 years of glucagon. And you can see this is the first study published by Alexei Klaitonico in 2005. So it's early days. Um, but there have already been several trials, so things are moving fast. And I also kind of want to thank all the very young, brave people uh, here doing all the human physiology, because that's, of course, very, very important for my work. But anyway, uh, Alexei, he found this compound uh, or protein because he did a screen in, uh, in adipocytes looking for a compound that, independent of insulin, could increase glucose uptake. And he found this compound or, or this N or, or protein, and you can see the, the um, glucose uptake here is mediated by the GLUT1 being very different from insulin, where we have the GLUT4 translocation. He uh, treated OBOB mice with FGF21, and you can see after seven days, there's normalization of the blood glucose, and it was actually also shown that FGF21 cannot induce hyperglycemia. So coming from a company living of selling insulin, that was, of course, very interesting to us. This was in mice, so of course there was some hesitant here, should we really go into this, this is only mice and so forth. But then in 2007, he actually uh, confirmed the data in diabetic monkeys. Um, and here he did a, a six-week treatment, is a dose escalating study, and he saw normalization of blood glucose in these diabetic rhesus monkeys. And you can also see we have a lowering of insulin. That's of course also really interesting. Can we actually increase insulin sensitivity? Um, so what is 21? And, and now I don't want to spend too much time here, but it belongs to this FTF family class. And there's a, a, a lot of fa uh, fibroblast growth factors that are, of course, involved in angiogenesis and growth and, and so forth. But the, the red uh, uh, class here, the 19 and 21 and 23, those are actually the endocrines FTF because they don't bind heparin sulfate and thereby they can escape into circulation working as hormones, the signals between tissues. And FDL21 is highly expressed in liver, and actually studies in mice showed that 
under some condition, uh, the main um, plasma FDF21 is actually derived from the liver, but it can also appear from other tissues, that's for sure. So now it circulates around these factors, and then if they can just bind to all the FDF, that's all over, but they don't do that because they require a co-receptor, and that is also what Tino talked about. That was the beta closer that is important for FGF21, and that is only selectively expressed on the adipocytes and in some specific regions of the brain, as shown here. And this is mainly also a mouse study. Recent study also shown that closer in the locus aureus, that's of course very important for noradrenaline production in the brain. Um, so let's talk about some of the pharmacology action of glucagon and FTF21. And I almost don't, we just, you know, we have to upload slide. I actually made slide on Sunday, <laughs> and now I had to change them yesterday. So Tino just asked me, I said, I'll just show a little bit of, 20, uh, of, the, uh, of the study that he, and he also nicely walks through them, so I don't want to spend a lot of time here. Um, that was the increase in FDF21 that was shown there. Of course, I was wondering, having the same data, you know, why was the the effect of uh, or the plasma FDF21 in a knockout my so low. Of course, there you did not see that increase that we saw. Um, that was the effect on body weight lacking in FDF21. Uh, human, there was also a human uh, 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 study in that publication showing that one milligram of glucagon uh, had a small increase in F plasma FDF21 after like these uh, two to three hours. So that these were the effect. I together with uh, Jonas and also did some study where we did actually not see it. So maybe that was due to the assay. That was the study with close, so I want to also include that so we don't have to go through that. So 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 FDF21, yes, it does really increase energy expenditure in mice, and that was actually shown quite early here, also by the Lilly group, showing that if you treat diomice, and this is a uh, pump study with FDF21, you can see within two weeks you have a 20% decrease in body weight. That is quite impressive, with no effect on food intake. That's also quite nice. I guess we all would like that. Uh, and you can see on the lower graph there that there was an increase in energy expenditure, and actually a bolus injection uh, of FGF21 does rise uh, temperature in mice. That was also shown in that paper. So how is this happening? And we just had the nice uh, walkthrough about the BMP 8, A or B? Was AB. <laughs> yeah. So I don't want to go through that, but of course we have the UCP1 in the brown adipose tissue. We also have the possibility to, to make white adipose tissue more brown. So that's the bright cells or the beige cells, wherever you come from in the world. And that's, of course, you have this uncoupling, and now you don't make your um, proton into uh, in ATP, but you make them into heat. And you can see in the lower figure there that, yes, there seems to be an increased staining of UCP1 in the adipose tissue in the mice that had been treated with FDF21. So this is mice, and this is now, uh, there was, I think Trisha had the question about the human thing, but because humans, of course, they don't have all the brown adipose tissue, and especially obesity have almost no brown adipose tissue. So we did a study in pigs because that's kind of how we think, you know, can we, can we do some modeling that actually mimic humans? And pigs, they do not express UCP1. So these studies are done not only to study the pharmacological effect, but also to early on understand some of the safety, right? So we did a lot of additional stuff here on bone mineral density, on cortisol, and uh, all, all kind of stuff in the, this paper. So we uh, gave them native FDF21 because as soon as we start to make um, compound uh, or analogs of something, of course, we might change something. So we did this with the native uh, protein here, and we treated them for 13 to 14 weeks, at first at a lower dose of 0.1, and then we took it to 0.3 milligram per kilogram. So in this study, uh, we also saw a very good effect on body weight. You can see these obese mini pigs, so they weigh almost 100 kilos. They actually only start to weigh weighing 30 kilos, but we feed them at Lipitum, so they get very obese. And they, they by this treatment, lost 17% of their body weight. So that was also pretty good. But we, of course, had on a daily basis measured food intake, and they ate less, okay? 
So that was a little surprise because the mice actually ate more. These are fed like a chow diet. Um, and, and we did not have metabolic chambers for the pigs, but we could calculate that all the body weight loss com was actually coming from a lowering of food intake. So that was the pig. So then there was also some monkey studying now it's time to get published. And that's the Lily analog up there showing a body weight loss um, of a few kilograms in, in spontaneous uh, obese uh, cyanomonkeys monkeys that are fed like a chow diet. And you can see they also have a lowering of food intake. So maybe also in the monkey, we have a lowering of, of food intake. And actually, Pfizer did a study where they included a pair fit group, also a non-human primate study. Uh, that was fed, and this is again the spontaneous obese cyanomonkeys uh, uh, monkeys that are fed a chow diet. So you can see here with the pair feeding, yes, it is the food lowering of food intake that drives the body weight lowering. We had access to some monkeys at the Kevin Grow over in Oregon, and these monkeys are actually fed a high fat diet. And these are racist monkeys. And you can see we did a dose escalation ending up at one milligram per kilogram, again, including a lot of the safety that we wanted to understand early on. And we had an 18% lowering of body weight, but no significant effect on food intake. Okay, so now you can start to be a little confused about what's going on here. Uh, of course, people would, would uh, kind of also notice this rebound in effect, right? So we, we, we also animals are trying to kind of gain the weight uh, throughout the washout. So then now we go to humans, because we of course had a lot of human study coming out throughout the last uh, 10 years. And this is a study uh, with a uh, close to antibody. So this is also an FCF21 antagonist, and you can see in the in the gray panel, um, let's see if I can maybe point to it. Can I? Oh, here. No, where is it? It's up here. There. Okay, that gray area here. They're in a clinic. Okay, and they all seem to lose weight, maybe a little more in the treatment groups compared to the placebo. So in a clinic, I guess you have some social restrictions or restraints that you don't eat as much as you use, and maybe the food is not exactly what you want, so you lose weight. And then you come out, and you're on your own, and you suddenly start to increase weight, also the placebo group. But maybe some of the lower doses here, not the high dose, they have a tendency to kind of overshoot, and, and they're still on the drug, right? They're still on FDL21 because this is an antibody with a very long half-life. So that was one study. Then the second study here, that's actually an empty study, and this is this effluxophamine that we just uh, discussed in the previous session. And here is also, here the first four days they're in the clinic, so they tend to lose a little weight, and then, then they, this is a, a multiple descending dose study, and you can see that the lower um, uh, doses of this compound actually also seems to increase body weight. But, 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 but different in, from one person to another, but there's something about this body weight and lower doses of FDF21. And we also have an analog, and this is an acylated analog, as all our proteins normally are, and here we actually also saw an, an increase in body weight. And I was called for this safety committee meeting because I had to explain why I see a body weight loss, and I, of course, could not explain that because all our animal lost weight. So you get some surprises as you go along, and I'll try to explain what we see. Let's go to the dio mice and the obese racist monkeys, and these are on a high-fat diet, right? And this is actually where we see this increase in energy expenditure. Okay, so then we go to the chow. Uh, this was the, both the monkey and the pigs. They eat less and, and, and therefore lose body weight. And then we have the humans that have this kind of free choice, right, that, that we don't really control. We don't really know what to eat. We don't, nobody had measured energy expenditure. We have been pushed to do that many times, and, and of course we've been, oh, what is the power and how many people do we need in the phase one trial to actually show that? So that has not been done by any yet. So that will be interesting to see. Of course the effect on body weight has been limited and actually also sometimes increased. And, and why is that? And, and, and actually in 2014 there was al always the first study showing that FTF21 might increased uh, the preference for protein, right? And you can see that in the mouse study up there, that my sweet with FTL21 has an uh, increased preference for eating protein. And now you can understand why FTL21 and glucagon with all the amino acid metabolism and stuff like that might somehow be connected. 
in the antibody, st antibody study, they also uh, actually asked people um, what they like to eat, and you can at least see they did not want any sweet. And now I can speculate that maybe the chow diet in this study were more sweet or more having a more sense of sweet compared to the high-fat diet study because th there was this preference that was uh, kind of affecting things. And it was actually also shown by um, Matt Gillum and, and, and uh, Pothoff and some of this stuff that having uh, some of these uh, mutations in FDF21 actually changed the preference. You, you, if you have a loss of function of 21, you want to eat, you actually eat more candy and more sugar and less protein, right? So it's actually also linked to genetic. And there's a study coming out um, that was 2021 showing from the UK Biobank that if you have a mutation where you have increased levels of 10, 21, so this is kind of a mental randomization study, you actually have a, an um, increased preference for protein and fat. And now I understood why my people gain weight, because you don't get fat from eating proteins, right? So, so, so the fat is something we don't understand really yet. And you can see a less preference for carb and alcohol and all this stuff. You also see here that there's a, a good effect on the waist to hip ratio. So people with 21 are actually very good at putting fat and maybe offloading the liver from fat because it's lower body fat that actually maybe increases. And we also need to do all the DEXA scan and understand what is happening to the fat. Again, where does things really go? Okay, so, so, so you can understand that this, uh, we had the, the talk about, was it a drug for diabetes? Well, we did not see huge effect in the clinical studies. You can understand why it's not taken forward in obesity. So now we are in NAS, and, and uh, Lisa Lotte was here, and, and I'll just show you that, of course, you have uh, the, um, the, the non equally fatty liver where you start with simple steatosis, and then you get inflammation and fibrosis, and in the end you get fibrosis, and this is like, you know, a lifelong um, kind of event almost. It takes several decades. Um, so, so this is the fluxamine data I just want to show you because this is the effect on liver fat on the amdan compound. And now you can see they did not include 7 and 14, but they went on the, all the way to 28 and 50. So high doses, there we did not have that effect on food intake. Um, uh, maybe there was some DI side effect on some nausea, at least that has been reported because at the highest dose, there was actually a, 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 a decrease in body weight, but not at the lower dose. Then, you saw, then we saw a very good effect on uh, triglyceride, or 50% reduction in plasma, and 20% reduction in non-HDL, and a 40% increase in HDL. So a quite good profile in terms of uh, cardiometabolism. Uh, HbA1c also went down 0.4% and C-peptide went down. So it actually is something about its insulin sensitivity effect that seems to take place, maybe related to this hip to waist ratio. So that was the FDF21, and we also have an analog in, in the clinic, and you can go look that up. I did not take, bring that today. Uh, but of course, you can wonder, with this lowering of liver fat, do we then restore glucagon resistance and what's going on? And nobody has measured amino acids, and hopefully we'll get that data one day. Um, and then we have talked about this analog, but nobody showed data, so I luckily included it. And this is the, um, the Aldemoon analog, uh, and, and this data was just published uh, like a month ago, and you can see a quite nice effect on a liver fat reduction of up to 70% is 1.8 milligram. So that's pretty nice. And of course, with this glucagon on board, do we have an increase in neurogenesis that was not shown? Or do we even have an increase in plasma FD of 21? 21 is normally as glucagon high in, in, you know, in liver fat and obesity and type 2. So I actually expect a decrease, uh, but let's, let's wait and see that. And this was the effect on body weight. So there was a 4.4% uh, reduction in body weight. Uh, and, and yeah, 4% reduction in body weight. So that's not a lot compared to a GLP-1 analog, but it has very dramatic effect on liver fat. Yes, yes, so we see this lipolytic effect in the liver. But uh, so, so, so I think that is, uh, that is pretty good shown here. And of course, I would think there's a minor contribution of um, glucagon to that body weight losing effect. Um, anyway, time is really running here and lots of stuff to say. This is the glucagon receptor knockout. We talked about that yesterday. The data from Roger Unger, I think Jens showed that. 
FCO21 is highly expressed in the, in the pancreas. I was sharing office with, with Gelling when he did all the knockout studies and he kept on telling me about this hyperplasia of the alpha cells. So I thought, okay, maybe there is actually FTF21 in the alpha cells. And yes, this is what we showed. And we actually showed this huge increase in FTF21 of 25 fold. Um, so that's much more than having adding glucagon. Uh, so anyway, when you strap the mice, we actually have a drop in, in FDF21. I think we also have a lower FDF21 in patients with type 1 diabetes. What does that mean and how, how does that happen? I don't know. We did some studies with Boerain showing that this anti-diabetic effect was actually mediated by FDF21 and DLP1 because DLP1 is also quite high in the glucagon receptor knockout mice. So I'm, I'm just going fast over this. So this is a kind of published. Let's go and spend the last five minutes on this fasting and feeding. Um, so, so we have a study here where we have people fasting for three days and have an increase in free fatty acids and an increase in glucagon, as expected. FDF21 is not increased, and many have shown that there's no increase in FDF21 in response to a short-term fast of three days. It comes quite late, and it comes actually quite late. And you look at the plasma amino acids, they're actually lower, starting to get lower after eight to nine days, but actually higher after three days. So that's also of interest. Um, and this is the glucagon. So glucagon actually pops up after three days and then it drops. Um, now, energy expenditure is actually decreased with fasting. Of course, it does not make sense to increase energy expenditure during fasting. And beta clot in the adipose tissue is actually also decreased. Um, in terms, so that's fasting. And then about feeding, um, this is some of the study with Jens and uh, uh, the Vidor group about bionic surgery. And there you can see FT of 21 in response to a uh, ODTT of 50 grams, a huge increase. Mixed meal with the same increase in plasma glucose does not increase plasma FT of 21 when you have uh, amino acids on board. And then we did a study with Alan Vo also, and you, you know this overfeeding study, we published the, the study said that high fat feeding induced 21. It was actually maybe more the lowering of protein in this study that makes sense. So macronutrition study, be aware of kind of what you change. Uh, we saw an the increase in energy expenditure. Now we are in a feeding state with high FTF 21 and a de decrease in free fatty acids. And now that could correlate to the Michael Stock hypothesis of diet-induced thermogenesis. And this is actually what has been shown, that FDF21 is required for diet-induced thermogenesis. This is the, this is the protein levels hypothesis. If you don't have enough protein in your diet, you'll eat more. And then if you're mice, you'll kind of burn it. So that's a good thing, because you, don't, you can't produce the essential amino acid yourself. It's also shown in human. So that was the feeding thing. So FDF21 comes from, from the liver in response to a high glucose, low protein diet, and it actually helps increase in glucose and lipid uptake into the adipose <coughs> tissue, and then change the preference. And then about energy expenditure, is that happening also in humans? So now, last few slides here, we have low glucose and high amino acids inducing glucagon. And we have high glucose and low amino acids, that gives us 21, and then uh, Jakob, sorry for about the, not mentioning the free fatty acid now. That will be too complicated. Um, so glucagon is induced by, by these factors um, and increased hepatic glucose production during fasting, right? If you use amino acids for the, uh, as gluconeogenic substrates, you have a nitrogen group that needs to be removed. That can only be removed by urogenesis, as I understand it. So that's, of course, very closely connected. 21, no effect on short-term, but long-term starvation. There you start to have a decrease in plasma amino acids and maybe a decrease in urogenesis. You want to prevent the oxidation of amino acids. And this is an old study showing alanine after three days goes up, uh, ex ex exactly the hepatic extraction to 230, and then after six weeks of fasting, I don't know who they include in that study, there's a huge decrease in, uh, in alanine here. So then just one thing about the glucagon, because I asked that several times, does, glu does glucagon induce growth hormone? Also an old study, and yes, it seems to increase growth hormone from uh, I think three up to like 20 after two hours. And after that, you have the increase in lipolysis. So that's what I think is going on, that it is actually growth hormone induced. 21 in our pigs actually decreased growth hormone. 
That also fit with lack of glucagon, with like a lack of growth hormone will actually preserve um, oxidation of protein. Um, and then about the energy expanded here, because as I understand and look old studies here again, that glucagon actually decreases T3 and increases reverse T3. So that will be a decrease in energy expenditure in a fasting state, right? Uh, and that fits with this uh, fasting state of lowering energy expenditure. Uh, so this was fasting, so I included uh, glucagon or, or growth hormones over there and the T3. And FGF21 decreasing growth hormone, energy expenditure, I would not know. And then fasting, um, my feeding, sorry. So now we have opposite again here, high glucose, low glucagon, high FGF21, and then we have the mixed meal. Um, and then we have glucagon now during feeding. We have a mixed meal with high protein. You know, how do you store protein? You of course have your muscle, but that's not a storage. Uh, the capacity can at least be exceeded. So you need to kind of get rid of, you eat a lot of protein, you have to get rid of that. That is also rheogenesis, and you have maybe an increase in hepatic glucose production. That then could increase insulin release, as we heard yesterday. Energy expenditure, yes, it could go up. Uh, could there be a change in food preference? I think this is something that would be really interesting if could, that could be understood from any genetic study. 21, high glucose, low protein. We have an increase in glucose and TD uptake in the adipose tissue. We have a change in proof, uh, uh, food preference. Now we want to eat more protein and we might have a decrease in growth hormone, but actually when you start to eat a lot of protein, you actually also have a good effect on growth hormone release. Energy expenditure, we have the T4, we measured that in our monkey study, and then we have dionase too that could uh, change that to a T3 in the adipose tissue. And then this might happen when you have the high fat present, right? So the mice on a high fat diet, yes, huge energy expenditure. <coughs> Pharmacology, I don't want to go through that because I think I'm almost over time, but at least very, very good effect. Both the co-receptor agonist and FGF21 receptor agonist are in clinical trials. Um, so very exciting times ahead of us in terms of anything can be done for NAS and it's called very complicated disease with uh, uh, biopsies and so forth. Um, so that would be interesting. And then the conclusion is that both agonism and antagonism increases plasma FTF21 in mice. Um, and the body weight lowering effect on glucagon is dependent on 21 in mice, and I think Tina showed that. And then we have the antagonism where we have increase in 21 and DLP1 that could be involved in some of the anti-diabetic effect that Roger Under talked about. And then FTF21 is regulated by lack of amino acids, both in the feeding and fasting state. And glucagon is regulated by high amino acids, both in the fasting and feeding state. So they're actually opposite as I see them. Um, and this is what I said, that we have this uh, uh, trials going on and it will be exciting to see what's going on. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much for the nice presentation. Any questions? Thank you, uh, Birgitte, for a nice presentation. So this is uh, somewhat uh, outside my uh, daily life anyway, but as I understand it, clearly there is a relationship between glucagon and FDF21 in that direction. But what about the opposite direction? It does FDF1, I know there are reported islet effects on beta cells, but does FDF21 also affect alpha cell function? At, at least in, in some of the first study, uh, there was a lowering of glucagon. And that could maybe make sense if you want to preserve amino acids for protein synthesis. So, and of course, that was also speculated. Could that be some of the anti-diabetic effect? I don't know if there's closer on alpha cells. I don't think so. I think we, together with uh, Jakob Hel uh, and Jakob Hexler, actually really looked into is there any closure on beta cells? Because we had also some some very good effect on insulin release when we took out the islets. But they've been really, um, they have not, there have been no requirement for insulin production in, in because we have a gluco insulin independent glucose uptake, so we have a very good effect there. But we, when we put islets into culture, I think we, we thought that clotor got expressed as an artifact. It's, it's short, complicated, but uh, sorry, hope you got it. Yeah. 
Oh, sorry. You can start. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Uh, just follow up on the on the previous question. So, what is uh, the secretion pa secretory pattern of FGF twenty one in the eyelids? Since they're they're quite well expressed in the eyelids. That that's also a good one, and I have not studied that. Um, that was the only times I seen it in the glucagon receptor knockout mice, but it must somehow come out in circulation. We measured uh, the expression in uh, both liver and adipose tissue, and there there was some slight increases, but they could not explain this 20-fold increase in plasma FGF21. But how it's going on, I would have, have no idea. They're very good data. So uh, with your dual agonist in the phase one study, did you also see an increase in heart rate? That, that was actually not my studies because we don't have any in development. Uh, that was Moon. So I don't know, but that's of course the discussion. Can you actually have a dose of glucagon where it's enough to remove liver fat without having inotropic effect on the heart? So, so I mean, the reason why I'm saying this is because the Lilly triagonist data, phase 1b, was just published in Lancet, I think, yesterday. And they see a... 10 BPM yeah. increase yeah. in Yeah, I heart think rate. that that is what you will see, but could there be a dose where you won't see it? And this is Aldemun, it's not our studies. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Uh, pleasure having you. Thanks. Uh, so from a physiological point of view, you, you argue that there are sort of like um, um, night and day uh, FGF21 and glucagon, right? So, so my, my question would then be, um, how can it then come that a glucagon appears to uh, stimulate FGF21 secretion? You know, how, how can we understand that yeah. uh, in, in, in acute setting? Uh, yeah, I, I think acute and acute, I, after two to three hours, that's not so acute. I think at that point, we already have growth hormone going on that induce lipolysis. FGF21 is also downstream of a PIPA alpha. Mm -hmm. Uh, promoter, so that could happen. You could also see it's also induced by high glucose and glucagon induced glucose, at least in the hepatocytes that produce 21. So could there also be an axis there? You know, then we have to try and see, uh, you know, Pepsi K knockout or whatever inhibitor if that would change that. So I, I don't know. Sometimes I think it's it's complicated, and I'm sure we see the effect, and it's true. But what really does it mean? Yeah, um, and my second, a more uh, pharmacological question is: um, so, are there any? And this is just my ignorance. Um, are there any FGF twenty one antagonist, or you know, something that is has Th that the was the paper that was just published okay. and showed that uh, because uh, Alexei Klytonikov, Cl he he actually worked with C terminal peptides for FGF twenty one, and some of these are actually uh, FGF twenty one antagonists. So I'm sure you talk to him; he will be happy to supply that. Yeah. Um, because it's a little hard to knock out clothes or any human. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe you can try some of the snips where you have loss of function. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a question over here. Yeah. Um, that was a great presentation. Yeah. And um, maybe I'm overthinking this a bit, but um, so the, the fatty acid release, the liberation from the, the white adipose tissue itself, not from the liver, um, that, that ends up in circulation. Do you think this is mediated by the FGF21 component of glucagon? Or what proportion of that liberation is responsible of just glucagon alone and maybe it's action at the glucagon receptor in the adipose tissue? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think, as far as I heard the last two days, that we have a lot of glucagon receptor in human adipose tissue. Um, that could be growth hormone regulated. But of course, during fasting, we would need the free fatty acids. And, and then during feeding, would that be different? Because then we also have insulin on board. That makes it a little complicated because then would that inhibit lipolysis? 21 actually inhibit lipolysis in the absence of insulin. So again, a way to store something where you actually lack a nutrition so you can eat more. <laughs> so yeah, 